We're glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. It's nice to see everybody's smiling face out there. If you're watching online, we're glad you're with us. We have a YouTube recording going, and uh, Facebook is in the back of the room today, so I tried to get a little wider screen. So we'll see how people like that on the video. But we do have some folks that love to watch it live, so welcome if you're watching live all the way back there. So you can say hi to Don in Florida. Everybody want to say hi to Don? Ready? One, hi, two, three. Hi, hi Don. Don. Okay, we just said hi to Don. He's going to feel special. I'm sure he will. He's not Florida. He's in North Carolina. I said the wrong state. I was like, yeah. The Spencer's I wanted Florida, him to go to Florida, Florida, I guess. Yeah. Hi yeah, he's in, no, in he is North Carolina. That's where he is. That's right. That's right. I stand corrected. Mr. Mr. Accuracy over here, yeah. God bless him wherever he ends. Wherever up. he is. <laughs> God bless him. That's right. He's on that's, right. that's good. Here's our scripture for the day, and it has the word of the day in it. See if you can guess what it is. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. In the NIV, it says we have this treasure in jars of clay. So, vessel is the word of the day. And we're not talking the ship in the sea kind of vessel. We're talking about the vessel, the clay pot. And uh, you all are crack pots, just like me. So, yes, crack pots. <laughs> yeah, even Pat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're all cracked pots, but that lets the light of God shine out through the cracks, right? Yes. Right. Amen. She's like, you better quit while I... <laughs> Better quit while I'm ahead. Speak for myself, Margaret says. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, let's stand and worship the Lord together. Our God is greater. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? Amen. He turned water into wine and he opened the eyes of the blind. Yeah. 
took all the strength God would give them, banded together, and said, this nation is one nation under God. Amen. It would be pretty Amen. cool. Amen. Yeah. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. How great thou art.
His body, the bread, his blood, the wine. children's message. I got a little, uh, little uh, experiment to do today. We'll see how this goes. 
Is this on? Can you hear me okay? Is it on? I can't tell if I'm on. Well, you guys, we're going to do an experiment. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And I tried it yesterday and it didn't work. Yeah? Okay, so we're going to try it today and see if it works. Okay, now. Oh, is my, is my microphone working out there? Yeah, it is. Okay, I couldn't, I couldn't tell. Sometimes, you know, the, the pastor's ears don't work. What have you got here? You got, you got a, a, a thing? And a, ooh. That's yours too? Okay, but you're sharing? That's a good thing. Okay, how many of you think I can turn water into wine? What do you think? You think I can? You think I can turn water into wine? Oh, well, here's, we're going to start with our wine here. We have to put some wine over there. Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the real thing. I tried it with grape juice, didn't work, so we had to go with the real thing. Okay. Ooh, it's dripping, isn't it? It's drippy, drippy, drip, drip, drip. Yeah, we got to make sure you got to drip. Drip right in there. That's why I got my towel right there, right? Okay. There we go. And like the pastor always says, keep the wine off the floor. Okay. Here we go. Now we got to put some water in here. Ready? Okay. So we've got water over here. It's a little shaky from time to time. All right. All right. All right. So I'm going to turn this water into wine. What do you think of that? Huh? Now not everybody in the back can see because of all these little heads in the way. So you can, you know, if, if you want. <sighs> I'm like a scientist. Yeah. Did you know that Jesus turned water into wine one time? He did. He did it. You, you're not buying it? Well, that's our Bible story for today, is that Jesus turned water into wine. He was at a wedding, and they ran out of wine, and that was a bad thing. So he turned water into wine. So, oh, oh, no. Oh, the best laid plans of mice and men. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, first you've got to do this. Uh, luckily, I have some extra water. And we have carpet cleaner, so that's a good thing. Okay, let's try it again. Jesus had this much trouble. <laughs> I don't think he did. <laughs> All right, let's try to see what happens. There we go. Ready? Ready? Oh, buddy. There it goes. Oh. oh, it's starting to go. It's starting to go. Uh, can you see? It's starting to go. Oh, baby. Look at that. Oh, it's turning into wine. Yeah. You want to drink it? words of one of my favorite uh, TV hosts. That ain't gonna happen. <laughs> okay, so what do you think? Did I just turn water into wine? Kind of looks like it, doesn't it? As I spill it all over the place. Okay, look. Turn water into wine. Yeah. So what do, you, what do you think of that? I mean, that's just a silly trick, isn't it? I mean, the water went in here. What happened? And it pushed the wine up into there. And, uh, okay. Okay, so listen to the story here. So when Jesus turned water into wine, guess how he did it? He didn't have two glasses. He, he had earthen jars. They were like 100, they were like 20 gallons, 20 to 30 gallons. Okay, so they were huge. 120 gallons, maybe as many as 180 gallons of wine. And he just said, what? Water. water. Uh, yeah, he, he started with water. And he said, now dip some out and, and give it to the, the person in charge and have him taste it. And he tasted it and he said, this is the best wine I've ever had. This wine is awesome. This is the best stuff. And Jesus didn't touch it. He didn't spill it like I just did. He, he, it was a true miracle when he did it. This was just a trick because the wine is lighter than water and the water goes down the bottom pushes the wine up to the top. So it's just, a, it's just a silly trick. But Jesus didn't have to do tricks. He did the real thing. He was a miracle maker, a miracle worker. And uh, in, a, in a certain sense, you, you three, four are all miracles too, right? Okay, you going to pray with me? I know. We're getting our little guys in our purse and everything. Okay, let's pray. Oh. Thank you, Lord, for this Bible story. Thank you for this true miracle that you turned water into wine. 
uh, and help us help these young ones to understand the miracle of knowing you each and walking with you each day. All right? And you're going to say amen for me? Amen. amen. Thank you. You can go. You can head back. That actually worked better than I thought it would. <laughs> For some reason, my little card trick didn't work. But. Oh, you remember, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody's going for candy. There you go. All right. Woo. So, yeah, that is our uh, message for today, Water into Wine. I want to The title of the message is Make Me Your Vessel. Nathaniel's going to come and read the scripture for us. It's printed right in your program. Uh, and you can also read the, the Luke uh, words below the John words, too. It's right in there for you in red, okay? All right, so let's listen as Nathaniel reads this passage for us today. This is John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God. Amen. Thank you, Nathaniel. Let's pray. Lord, we've, we've heard this miracle before, that you turned water into wine. Sometimes we've wondered why you did that and what was up with that. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, open our eyes to some new truths. I know I learned some new things this week as I prepared for this message. You, you reveal, uh, it's like your word is alive because you show us new things all the time, uh, things that almost we might take for granted unless we're willing to listen and think through things and let you inspire us into new thoughts. So give us some new thoughts about this today and help us to uh, want to be your vessel. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so um, I noticed one thing as I read through this. John chapter 2 starts on the third day. Now, not long ago, I did a study. I did a word search in Scripture. You can get a Bible app, and you can search um, third day. And you can see all the wonderful things that happened on the third day. Or after three days, you know, like fast for three days and then. So there's a list in your bullets, and I'm going to read through them since our folks online don't have that in front of them. But terrific things happen on the third day. You see, three is one of the perfect numbers in Scripture, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So three, and that's why pastors always have three points, because, you know, perfection. I have more than three today, so I'm falling short. Um, okay, here we go. In the Bible, terrific things happen on the third day. Now, here are just a few, a few highlights from Scripture about things that happened on the third day. Life came to planet Earth on the third day. You can read that in Genesis 1. The Lord came to Moses on the third day. And that's in Exodus 19. I love this one. Israel crossed the Jordan River after three days of fasting. They fasted for three days and then they crossed the Jordan River. So on the third day, whoo, there they go. Number five, Israel finished rebuilding the temple on the third day of a month. Fascinating. I mean, all these things might be you know, a little bit of a coincidence until you put them all together and you realize these third days are all connected. Number six, Hosea, the prophet, predicted resurrection of the Messiah on the third day. Hmm? 
I forgot the fourth one she says. Oh, that's an important one because Jesus quoted this one. God delivered Jonah from a fishy tomb on the third day. Remember the story of Jonah? He rebelled against God. He ran away from Nineveh and ran toward somewhere else and got on a ship and then he got into the water and then on a, a whale or a fish ate him up and he was inside and boy did he start praying. And he prayed and uh, then yeah, on the third day the fish... Lord had the fish spew him out back onto the beach. And at that time, Jonah learned his lesson and said, I guess I better go to Nineveh. So he went. Okay. Uh, and then number seven, are we up to number seven? We're up to number seven. Jesus said he would rise on the third day, and he did. He even talked about how the only sign that they will get from me as the Messiah is the sign of Jonah. And after, on the third day, he will arise, and he did. Um, there are, if you're curious, there are four numbers of perfection or completeness um, in Scripture, 3, 7, 10, and 12. Seven's pretty easy to think of. You have the seven days of creation, right? Twelve, you have the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12, um, uh, the 12 disciples. Ten, I can't quite remember about the ten. Look that up and tell me what you find. Okay, on 10. But that's my, my commentary says, and you know, commentary. The 10 comment. There See, there you go. <laughs> Good job. That was from Nathaniel from the back row. In case you're wondering online, Nathaniel said, 10 commandments, number of perfection and completeness. We don't need the 11th one. Okay. All right, so let's, let's talk about make me your vessel. What did Jesus do in this miracle? Well, simply put, he turned water into wine. But what does that mean? Well, essentially, it means he converted common H2O into the best C6H14OS. And it's, a mo you see how, see, on the left is a water molecule, and on the right is a wine molecule. It's a lot bigger, isn't it? Molecules just made out of atoms, we learned in science class. Uh, eons ago, not sure if they had this back, you know, when some of you were in school, but they did. Uh, <laughs> she's, she, Margaret's looking at me like, do not go there. <laughs> I think I just did. Okay, so the molecules are bigger and they got lots more stuff in them, not just uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Other things added to those molecules. Hmm. So that's what he did. Now, then, the question I would want to know is, well, exactly now, how did he do it? How, how did he do it? It wasn't a trick like I did up here. How did he do it? Well, he added new atoms to the water molecules. And this is called creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. That should sound familiar to us. And this was a whole lot of wine. It would have been anywhere from 120 to 180 gallons of wine that he produced. He didn't touch it. He didn't wave a magic wand over it. He just told the guys, put the water in the jugs. And he said, now dip some out and hand it to the master of ceremonies and have him check it out. Somewhere along in that process, there was wine in those jugs. Creation ex nihilo, out of nothing. The Lord God created the universe out of nothing. So we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus could create wine by adding things out of nothing to something to make a better something. And he instantly fermented the compound. You see, good wine takes time. And so Jesus sped up the process. You know, you can't just put wine in a skin, it has to age, right? It has to ferment. The sugars and everything has to work together and it takes good time. The longer you let it sit, usually the better tasting wine you get. Uh, and so uh, this is a creation of a mature substance. So that's important as well. He created a mature substance. He didn't just convert something, he affected the time that's, that's pretty neat. 
Now, when did he do it? Well, we know he did it on the third day. So is that the third day after John chapter 1? Or could it have been the third day of a seven-day wedding feast? Now, wedding feasts were seven days long back then. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, in our day and age, and I, I, do, I say this at weddings often, that uh, our modern-day weddings are pretty much all about, about the bride. 99 times out of 100, it will be the bride who calls me to schedule the date for a wedding. 99 times out of 10. Once in a while, if she's an introvert and he's an extrovert, a guy, the guy will call me. Uh, but uh, it's all about the bride. Here comes the bride, right? And so the guy's standing up front, and he's waiting and waiting, and then we all stand, and here comes the bride. Really, it's all about the bride. And I like to tell wedding parties, and I say this often so that uh, in-laws will hear at the rehearsal, the bride gets to decide. Okay, how are we going to do this? Whatever it is, standing, you know, certain things about hugging or whatever you're going to do, and ushering in and out, walking in with partners or not, no partners, the bride gets to decide. Because pretty much it's the, the, it's, it's the bride day, bride's day, and I can't tell you how many times guys have looking at me like, just tell me when to be there, I'll be there. You know, it's not like they don't care. Of course, for guys, it's the end of something, and for women, it's the start of something. So we do have opposite ways of looking at it. It's the end of singlehood for the man, it's the beginning of matrimony for the woman. Um, that's in our DNAs. In Bible days, it was the exact opposite. Because for a man to find a bride was to find a good thing. Uh, to be sort of made, made complete. You know, it was the Jerry Maguire, you complete me. And, uh, you know, they wanted the man to grow up in, in the community, um, make a livelihood, be able to get a home, and be able to, um, to get married, find a woman and get married. And so really, it's all about the groom. And so what they would do is they, the uh, wedding party would come to the groom's house first, and they would all get together, and then they would go over to the bride's house, and they would get her, and they would bring her back, and it would kind of be like a big fancy parade, and they would get together, they would have the wedding, and then for seven days, everybody would celebrate that this man is now married. How cool is that? And so they would uh, feast and feast and feast, seven days. I mean, ours don't even last seven hours. Thank the Lord. I mean, how many weddings have I done where I can sell? Everybody's like, let's get to the party. Let's get to the party part. <laughs> we usually don't go to the party part. Occasionally we do. And about the time they cut the cake, it's time to kind of mosey, mosey out of there if, if there are things like uh, wine and, and beer and such there. Then we usually leave around the cake cutting, right, sweetie? That way we get our sweets and then... As the group gets a little loud, we're like, okay, it's time for us to head out. Uh, no problem. But um, so one night, one evening is to celebrate with the bride and, and groom, and then we send them off. Off they go. Well, um, as I read through this, I thought, you know, the way Greek reads, it does say on the third day they were at this wedding feast that Jesus and his, him, and his disciples were invited to. And in, in Greek, you don't have, you, you can order the words in various ways. So it actually could have been on the third day of the seven day wedding feast. Um, that certainly would add a little, little sim symbolic uh, oomph to the thought, right? That, that the party was just about dead. You know, Jesus brings new life into dead situations. This social situation was about, was about to be dead and he fixed it. So now, why did he do it? Why did he turn water into wine? And, you know, when I was young, 20-something, uh, I used to think, well, <laughs> the Lord wanted to keep the party going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so alcohol can't be all that bad. You know, see, I used it as an excuse. But it wasn't really to keep the party going. Um, he did it for two reasons. One, his mom asked him to. And what good Jewish boy, even if they are age 30, wouldn't, wouldn't obey their mother. I mean, he had to honor his father and mother, one of the Ten Commandments. And so he, he kind of pushed back and said, Dear woman, now what, what does this have to do with me? I mean, you know, my time has not yet come. And uh, she didn't even say anything 
to talk him into it, she just turns to the servants and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. She had no idea what he was going to say, but whatever he tells you to do, do it. You know, that's a good thing in, in all of our relationships with the Lord. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. You know, that would be great. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Well, I learned that the groom could be held legally liable for killing the party. He could actually be sued for having run out of, of supplies for this seven-day feast. You know, he's supposed to be ready for a seven-day feast, and if he wasn't ready, kind of a bad omen, uh, people, you know, could get upset with him. They could actually sue him. They could take him to court over this. It seems kind of odd to us, but that's tr true. So Jesus was saving the groom. He was saving the groom from not just embarrassment, not just social disaster, but actually legal trouble as well. So Jesus comes to the rescue, and uh, everything is saved. And, of course, it's the best wine. And if anything, the groom is, looks like a hero because he appears to have saved the best for last, when usually the best comes out first. And then when everybody's had a few and the days are going on and you don't care as much, you know, you get the cheap stuff out. Well, not, not this groom. He looks great because he saved the best for last. You know, Jesus always brings the best, doesn't he? He brings more than we could imagine, more than we could ever ask or imagine the Lord will do for us. Um, and so I just love this story for that reason. And so my last question is, and uh, you know, all these questions have to do with being a good detective, right? We've been talking about being a detective of scripture. You gotta ask yourself questions about why is this here? How did he do it? When did he do it? Uh, why did he do it? So we just looked at why, well, what about who cares? <laughs> the who question might be, well, who cares? Uh, John, you and me care. Certainly the groom and his thirsty guests are happy. Okay, put that aside for just a second. John cared enough that he put this first in a list of seven magnificent seven miracles of Jesus. Jesus did many miraculous things. Uh, John even says later on, he says, there are so many things I could have written about, but these things I've written that you may know you have eternal life. So I wrote these, says John, because you need to know these. And a good eyewitness will, will do that, won't they? An eyewitness will pick things that the audience or his readers need to know. So John is, is really doing this for us. Um, he says, See, this is the first of seven things that demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of God, the deity of Christ, the Godhead who is upon this human being, fully God and fully man, because only God has dominion over matter, space, and time. God has dominion over matter, space, and time. He created it. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, there's your time, God created what? The heavens and the earth. The heavens, space, the earth, matter. Stuff you can reach out and touch. How cool. So, you know, Jesus is showing his mastery over time because he pr produced a mature subject, uh, substance, and, uh, and over matter itself by changing its very nature. Changes this playing old water into, into wine. So, um, the more that I have thought about this, the more I have realized that uh, as I read through Genesis 1-1, and I've read through it, you probably have many times, um, he separated the, the darkness from the light, and he called, let there be light, and he called the light day and the darkness night, uh, and so there was the beginning of the, the day and night, and so and that was the first day of creation or whatever. And so he goes through, and, and to me, as you read through it, it's like, yeah, th he's talking about, the writer is talking about a 24-hour day because he said, in the, and there was uh, evening and there was morning and there, the, the sixth day or the fourth day or whatever day it was, okay? And he repeats that almost in a poetic fashion throughout. And so... I have thought, and you've heard me mention this if you've been here a while, um, I have become a believer in the short earth 
concept. Uh, short Earth, kind of short Earth. Short time, short time span. The Earth is really 6,000 years old and I can prove it to you. Well, I don't know if I can prove it to you. I wasn't there 6,000 years ago. Well, wait a minute, the science say it was 14, the universe is 14 and a half billion years old and the Earth is eight and a half billion years old, but Wait a minute, they weren't there either when it was created, so how do they really know? Well, they measure things of today and they extrapolate backwards and they assume that things have always happened the way they measure them now and so they can go back and, you know, and they have all this radiocarbon dating and, uh, and stuff that uh, has been proven, you know, to be fallible. It's, it's not foolproof. And so they try to pr bring out facts that are facts. And we've all been indoctrinated into millions of years Millions of years. Evolution takes millions of years because given enough time, you know, a creature could evolve into something more. Well, that really doesn't, that really violates biological laws because as generations happen, genetic material is lost, not gained. So that doesn't make sense. And, and I don't care for 86 or 92 or 96% DNA compared to an ape is the same. That doesn't matter. It's what's different that matters. And how big is that difference? That, big, that difference is huge. You know, they try to claim, uh, well, of course, you know, animals have hearts and lungs and uh, they're made, they're carbon based life forms as we are. We should share a lot of the same DNA, but it's the difference that matters. Um, and so I used to think. How could, how could God have created, how could the earth be so young? If I believe in the young earth, and it sounds like I should based on what scripture says, how is that possible? Well, that is only possible if the Lord created the universe mature. It appears that it's expanding, but he produced it in a way that it's expanding from when he produced it. It was already there. The light from stars, billions of stars, light years away, appeared in the sky when God said it would. So he not only created th that remote star billions of light years away, take the light, what, millions, billions of years to get here, but it says in Scripture that the light appeared in the sky when he created it, when he said it would. So he creates this star at a distance and the light from it shining th down on the sky on the earth on whatever third or fourth day that was of creation. So I do believe in the young earth and I challenge you with that because it's a mind bender. You've heard so much about millions of years, millions of years, and they'll take a rock and they'll say it was millions of years old. And uh, Look at Answers in Genesis, look at um, guyquestions.org, various other things. Look, research it if, you're, if you really are doubting me about this young earth. But see, Jesus just did it here. He created a mature substance, not just the start of what will become wine, but mature wine in an instant. That's how powerful God is. Our God is big enough that he could create a mature universe like that. Spoke it into existence. Ba-boom, there it is. Things have not always gone the way it looks today. Uh, you can find in 2 Peter that uh, Peter predicted that people would make the mistake of measuring everything based on what they measure today. That radioactive decay would always be the same. Erosion would always be the same. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Mount St. Helens created a 24-foot canyon in 24 or 48 hours. Uh, and there's a water trickling at the bottom, and that water at the bottom had nothing to do with carving out that rock. It was the mud. <laughs> So catastrophes, see, they ignore catastrophes. We know Noah's flood happened about 4,000 years ago, and we have evidence for it everywhere, but you can just ignore, uh, you can ignore that evidence if, if it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't support your, your theory, right? So, but, so, so as your pastor, I believe in that. I, I, and I have thought about it for years now, and I thought, you know, why should I limit God into thinking he has to create a, a bang and then it spreads out for a billion years? Maybe he created a mature universe that looks like it came from a big bang, but he created it ready to go. Okay, there's another example if you don't believe me on that. Um, 
did uh, was when God created Adam, was he full grown or a baby? The way you read scripture, it, he created a man, a human being. So did he have a belly button? Nope. No belly button. God created him from the dust. You know, and if you look at me, if you look at uh, what science says, yeah, we're, we're pretty much that's what we're made out of, dust. You know, carbon, that's what dust is. So, yeah. So we see, we see examples of God being able to do this all the time. I think he created Eve fully formed. And Adam said, woo yeah, good job, God. <laughs> now what do I do? Okay, so matter, space, and time, and I do believe in a young earth. If you don't, look into it, study it, think about it, pray about it. Have God open your eyes. All right, slide number seven, it says here. Oh, perfect number, seven. Um, Lord, make me your vessel. You see, Jesus wants to be your, he wants you to be his vessel. He wants you to be his vessel. The old you cannot contain Christ, for an old wine skin cannot hold new wine. If you look over on the other page, Luke 5, 37 through 38 says, Jesus said, and no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. You know, as it develops and everything, the wine will run out. The wine skins will be ruined. New wine must be poured into new wine skins. So to be able to receive the new wine that Jesus wants to put in you as his vessel, you have to be made new. You have to be spiritually reborn. Um, you need to be made new again. And if you think you were, but then you fell, fell, fell away from the Lord, um, God will do for you what the old folks used to do when all they wanted new wine, the old skin was empty and dried out and cracked. But that was the only skin they had. What would they do? They would, they would put oil on it. They would massage it. They would work it soft. You know, guys, like when you get your, and ladies, when you get your softball mitt and you'd put your ball in it, you put mink oil on it, and you you train it to go. You know, it was that type of thing. You could you could use they could use olive oil to soften the leather and make it pliable again. So you can be made soft and you can be made renew, and that's that's what God calls revival. We can be revived uh, into a new wineskin for God to place his wine in. So the new you, born of the Spirit, can flex with the changes wrought by Christ in you. And so our prayer there is, Lord Jesus, make me new. Make me more like you. Let's pray together. Lord, would you make us new? Lord, make me new and make me more like you. Lord, make me your vessel. I pray for each of us that each one would be a vessel. And though I be a jar of clay, and though I be a cracked pot, you still want to enter into me. Lord, may your light shine through my broken parts to a hurt and dying world. Amen. So that's a prayer that you may want to take with you uh, to pray and, think, and to really think about whether you're a new wineskin uh, or not. And we are going to share in communion. Uh, I will give us a few instructions first. We're going to watch a video, and then after the video, uh, you, can, you can come forward. Um, in our church, communion, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, is open to all who trust in Christ for your salvation. You're not trusting in your own effort. You're trusting in Jesus' work on the cross, his blood, his body. There's nothing you can add to it. Need, don't need to add to it. Praise the Lord, right? And so, as we usually do, we come down the center aisle, we serve ourselves, and then go back that way. And, um, but let's return, and then please wait until all have, are served and we'll partake uh, together. Now, we're almost heading into Lent, and so I found a, a short little video about Christ in the Passover. This is an overview of it, and I wanted you to see this, uh, Christ in the Passover. Passover, a celebration of deliverance, of freedom from bondage, bondage that God's people experienced before the exodus from Egypt. 
But Passover is also a story of God's redemptive love. It is my story, and it is your story. If we choose to embrace it, we embrace him. Sea-soaked carcass and the bitter herb remind us of the tears shed in slavery under Pharaoh's thumb, a reminder that life in bondage without redemption is a life drowned in tears. The Passover lamb points to the God of Israel who, in his unwavering commitment to deliverance, rained down plagues on Pharaoh's Egypt. The worst of these came in the darkness of death's shadow. But God's outstretched arm shielded Hebrews from harm, giving one narrow way to escape, through the covering of each door with the blood of a spotless lamb. This, the one measure of obedience meant to save every firstborn son, a sacrifice in blood. It was by this sacrifice that freedom was secured. Death passed over the blood-painted doorposts. They were spared a swift judgment and delivered from Pharaoh because of the blood of a lamb. Heeding a warning from God, Pharaoh would pursue the Israelites in their exodus. The Israelites took with them unleavened bread. And so, with Passover, leaven is removed from the home and the heart, since leaven is a reminder of the past and of sin. So why should we dwell on such a story? Perhaps because our own often self-serving choices can once again enslave us, making us deaf to the voice of the one who wants us to experience true freedom. Only he can deliver us from the delusion that we know best. Without him, we are as alone as the Israelites in the desert of Egypt. Only by crying out to the God of Israel and accepting his sovereignty can our bondage be broken. The Passover Jesus shared with his disciples at the Last Supper signaled the end of blood sacrifice. He paid the ultimate price when he died at Calvary. As the Son of God, he came to deliver us from more than just the slavery of Pharaoh, but from our own sin so that death will pass us over. Jesus is the Afikon broken, buried, and brought back. He is the sacrificial lamb, the blood on the doorposts of our hearts, and by his death and resurrection, he brands us, all of us, free, forgiven, and loved. If this forgiveness of sin and eternal life he offers is yours, you can eat this bread and drink this cup meaningfully. And if you've never known his redemption, but sense it and want it, he is waiting to free you and call you one of his own. Amen. Wonderful. And so uh, prepare your hearts, and as you are ready, uh, you come, and I will play some music as you come. Stand together if you're able and make your way to the center.
now the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance. Christ died for you. Feed upon him in your heart with thanksgiving. <clears throat> The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to go into a time of prayer. I have some prayer requests that were handed in already. Does anyone else have any? Austin will fetch them for you. Maddie says she has a prayer request for you. Did you write it down? Probably not. Can't write yet. But uh, and Nathaniel's coming down. He's going to kneel in prayer, and I think others might want to do that. If you if you would like to come forward and kneel, you're welcome to do that. Sometimes it just helps us connect with God, get out of our seat, and come up and change our perspective and our uh, posture, right? So we're going to pray through some requests, and then we are going to anoint Margaret on behalf of Soon Hotchkiss. Soon is struggling for life uh, after probably nine weeks uh, in the hospital now in Saginaw so uh, we want to pray for her and Margaret just felt led to be anointed on her behalf so we're going to do that as we uh, pray through this list of, of things Lord come to you in the name of Jesus thank you for your many encouraging blessings in our lives. Thank you that you put your new wine into us. Uh, you fill us as your vessels, Lord. We often feel like we're not worthy, but you know that we're jars of clay, and you have chosen to come in us and to be in us. We're grateful for that. Thankful, thankful that you pour your love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us the spirit of Christ to be in us, Lord. And we pray for many today who need. And the first prayer, Lord, comes from one of our children whose kitty is very sick. And so we lift up Jinx to you, Lord, and we pray that you would heal him, uh, that the infection would go away, the medicine would do its job, and that Jinx would be saved. Uh, he is well loved, and uh, we look forward to seeing more wonderful pictures of him online. Lord, we... Uh, are looking ahead. Let's see here. Okay. Um, Candy Firmingham has moved to Bay Medical, a specialty hospital for rehabilitation. Lord, be with Candy. Help her to be able to, for her body to be rehabilitated to where she can be strong enough and breathe well enough to be able to go home eventually, Lord. And and then it looks like Peggy and Jim are returning to Michigan for surgery uh, on his foot. And Lord, you know what's going on with Jim. And we pray your healing on his foot, on his leg. Lord, if the doctors, whatever the surgery we, they do, we trust that your hand will be upon them and um, guiding those surgeons. Um, help, help Jim and Peggy to get home safe. And I think of Peggy and Gary Spencer, who are also on their way back. Uh, perhaps they're already back to Michigan, but pray you'd watch over them as they travel as well. Um, we lift up Lee Myers to you. He's got cataract surgery March 2nd. It's coming up this Wednesday. And so please be with Lee and I pray that his eyesight would uh, return, that he could see clearly, um, help his eyes to heal, and the surgeons to do the wonderful job that, that they do. And Lord, we want to lift up Vernon to you. He is going to have a scope done on Tuesday. Lord, another esophagus problem going to see why he's having trouble swallowing. Lord, and this is coming, it seems more common, but uh, we ask for Vernon and the others we know who struggle with her esophagus, Lord, that you would 
heal and bring your wholeness and then the, this procedure would go well and that they would figure something out through the scope uh, of his esophagus. And so watch over him, keep him safe and, and give uh, Kathy your peace as well. <clears throat> Lord, we also want to lift up the people of Ukraine to you. <clears throat> we know that many have been hurt and will be hurt in the fighting that's going on there. Lord, I pray that you would bring peace into that nation. I pray, Lord, that you would even make a way for the Russians to somehow save faith, face by getting out of there. Uh, make a way for them to get out of there without feeling like they've they failed. But we're asking that they would fail, Lord. That you, Ukraine would, would continue to be an independent nation. We don't want to see another Soviet Union, Lord. And pray for wisdom for our leaders in Europe and America to decide how to assist the Ukrainians to remain independent, Lord. And Lord, I pray that maybe out of this, Ukraine would actually become a democracy. How cool that would be. Uh, I know that they're not right now, uh, but we ask that the, that would be a uh, sort of a true thing that would happen. Perhaps the government would, would become in and the people would be even more free. Uh, but set them free from this evil invasion we're asking in the name of Jesus for that and now Lord we're going to move to praying for soon Lord we've been praying for you for her and many have from the UP to the lower peninsula and all around the nation I imagine as people have asked prayer for her um, and Margaret you've known soon for a long time uh, they left before I came so I don't really know her <laughs> So let's gather around Margaret and you want, can you kneel or no, you can't, you don't need to stand up. We don't want to mess. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was just, yeah, I, I thought you were. No. There's a lot of joy. In, do you want to? Okay. God bless you. We will help you. Lord, we thank you for Margaret. Thank you for her heart and willing uh, to come and be anointed on behalf of Sue, Lord. Lord, you know what Sue is dealing with. You know her body has been fighting this COVID virus and this infection. And so, Lord, we're asking for a great healing. And um, Margaret, we anoint you behalf of soon we, we anoint you in the name of the Father and of the Son and then the Holy Spirit we anoint you for healing in the name of Jesus the great physician Lord may your healing flow through Margaret even now and may it go all the way over to Saginaw and Lord, raise up Margaret I mean raise up soon Lord that she uh, help her to open her eyes and to think clearly and to be able to breathe deep Lord uh, make her lungs new like when she was a baby and uh, help her body to get strong again and be with Willard, Lord, and heal his heart. I can imagine what he's going through for nine weeks now. Uh, so bring him spiritual healing and strength and grace and peace. May your grace be sufficient for each one because we know your grace is sufficient for us. It's sufficient for Margaret, for soon, and for others. Lord, I thank you for this church family and thank you for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Let Nathaniel get over here and help. Oh. You got a strong back, don't you? There you go. All right. Oh, what a wonderful prayer time. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Yeah. Do you believe it? God is good all the time. Even when times are bad, God is good. And bad things happen to good people. But God is good all the time. And all the time. All right. 
Well, our offering will be received in our offering boxes, as has been our tradition since COVID started. So you can use the one up here or the one in the back there. And uh, thank you for supporting your church. Uh, we're self-funded by our own tithes and offerings. A few family matters to share with you. I'm excited for this week as Lent kicks off. Uh, whoops, not the dinner today. Um, small groups, we do have Tuesday prayer group at 7. That's online if you would like to get to join us online. And especially if you have your phone with you today, we can set it up today so that you'll be ready to go and we can just call you on, on Tuesday night. Uh, we've got 8 to 10 people involved in that already and probably half a dozen phones. Uh, Wednesday Bible study at noon here at the church. Uh, so if you want a, a one-hour Bible study, come on Wednesdays at noon. Worship team is at 7, Sunday adults class, um, 9.45. Okay. Church movie night is coming March 4th, and that is this coming Friday. We're going to watch Sabina. So we'll come at 7, we'll have some music and some popcorn and stuff. And the other thing that's in your program, if you flip your program over, look at March 2nd real quick. March 2nd. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And it's a day that we celebrate the beginning of the season of Lent. And Lent is simply a time for us to prepare our hearts for Easter. And uh, so it has always been in the church uh, calendar, so to speak, the, church, the tradition of the church. Like we have Advent, we have Lent, which is the time of preparation, preparing us uh, for Easter. And so we're going to have a community service this year. So this is a new thing, a new community service for Ash Wednesday. I will find out on Tuesday whether we'll actually do the ashes on your forehead or not. We're not, I'm not, I, I'm not sure if, if we're going to go that way again. But, you know, it's, uh, it's cool that it's this, this year we're going to do Ash Wednesday at the Spring of Life Community Church in downtown Mayville, the former United Methodist Church. So, and the UMC Church has been invited from the big church to come on over to to uh, Spring of Life. So it starts at 6.30, so be, get there before 6.30, okay? And it should be about an hour long. Our worship team is going to provide the music for the singing. I'll check the time. I, I may have messed up. It six, starts at 6.30, so I'll check it. Yeah, if you come at 5.30, you'll be there on time. Yeah. <laughs> Some might think I was trying to fake out Leanne with that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so no, it starts at 6.30. Um, we're going to do the music, and Pastor Dennis is going to preach. Um, not sure what we're going to do, if we're going to do the ashes, but we'll celebrate uh, that regardless of the fact that, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it, the ashes are just a reminder that we're mortal. And from ashes we come, and to ashes we, we will return. That's in Ecclesiastes, so that is just what, where that tradition sort of came from. Um, and then Good Friday is going to be at our church here, and I think Pastor Nate from United Methodist Church is going to preach that night, so he'll bring the sermon. We'll do the music here uh, for Good Friday, so kind of put that in, in your thoughts for the Friday before Easter. We're also looking at some kind of a... Um, Passover celebration where we have Jews from Jesus come in and teach us, do a presentation of the Seder meal, which was the Lord's, what we call the Last Supper, was a Jewish Seder meal. And the significance and the symbolism in that, Christ is in it through, throughout, as you can see. Uh, the cup that he, that he raised was the cup of blessing, the cup of redemption. There are three different, four different cups. <laughs> the third cup, is, again, there's a number three. The third cup in the Seder meal is the cup of blessing, the cup of redemption. How cool. So, so we're looking to make that happen. Uh, also, that would be the week of, of uh, Good Friday, probably after, uh, after Palm Sunday. Uh, so, but be thinking about that. Um, and again, the movie that we're going to show this coming Friday is called Sabina. The heart of the gospel is forgiveness. So, and I've got a big screen that we can put up and a projector, and so it'll be a little bigger. You won't have to try to watch it off the TVs here. You'll be able to see it on a big screen. Uh, 
well, big for us anyway. So, you know, the closer you get, the bigger they look. But, uh, but Friday night, popcorn and music at 7, and then we'll start the movie at 7.30. It's a private movie screening, so it's free. We don't have to charge for it. Um, so invite your friends to come to that. Uh, any other family matters to share? Yeah, we are having a board meeting Thursday. Yeah, we've got a busy week for us. We, ha we pretty much need to because snow killed the, the February meeting. So we, we need to meet uh, So the board meeting. It's a ministry leadership team coming this Thursday. Yeah, busy week. Well, let's stand and praise the Lord with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, you are a blessing. Go and be a blessing to someone else today. Amen.